when we pulled into the town center here, the whole place was on fire. I vividly remember this building here behind us being on fire. The whole area just smelt of ethnic cleansing. Uh, there was a smell of uh, burning wood, of, of burning flesh, of burning animals. It was, it, it was, it was everywhere. I, I just came around the corner and uh, it was a Croatian. I think he was a, a sergeant and he had his AK and the guy had just thrown a kid into the burning house. You see, what they were doing was killing people and friggin' throwing them into the building. So this bastard had, had just killed a kid and, and he was dancing around with a friggin' pair of underwear on his head thinking he was something special. And again, we were gonna, we were gonna pop that guy and he just put his rifle on the ground and then his platoon came around the corner and they were all kind of standing around laughing and they had bundles of stuff from the house, the cutlery, the silver, anything that was worth money they had in these big bags and it was just like they'd been on a shopping trip. As we pulled in, there was approximately 70 Croatian soldiers uh, we're in and amongst this area, in behind us here, in behind me, with uh, with three trucks, and uh, and they were laughing at us as they uh, as we came in, and they erased that whole place. There was nothing left. There was nothing left alive in the pocket. In the end, we couldn't save anything. They had had a very well orchestrated program. They had brought in wood from outside to seed the fires. They had their police integrated with their military, so the police were having roadblocks set up while the military were, were exploding uh, buildings with anti-tank mines. No buildings were left untouched. They don't care they're gonna kill everything, and they did. A soldier's job isn't to clean that up, but that's exactly what we ended up doing. There's rats, there's maggots, there's flies everywhere. You keep finding human bodies. Some of them are in good shape, so you can pick them up and take them to the road. Other ones, you, you know, you grab a, an arm and it comes off, and, and then you go grab another piece, roll it onto a piece of pl plastic or a wheelbarrow and take it to the road, then the body crew can come around and pick it up. We left the pocket, went into camp, they gave us a bunch of beer and some lobsters. We ate that, we threw it up because we weren't used to fresh food anymore. We'd been eating IMPs. And we got on the plane and came home. So within the space of 36 hours, we're in a bar in downtown Winnipeg from the pocket. That's a culture shock in anybody's imagination. When we came home in October of 93, Somalia was just breaking. Um, we had scandal in Somalia, or at least the strong scent of a scandal in Somalia at that time. And the focus was all on what had happened uh, with that particular tour. And not even the, the entire Somalia tour, just the bad part of that tour. And I think it's fair to say that for the next two years, that consumed most of the focus of the public's attention on the military. And all of the other things that had happened, including our tour, um, were cast into the background. The fact is that the medic pocket battle was kept quiet for over two years 
just because they thought, well, gee, we shouldn't be telling the Canadian public we're actually killing people for peace. I mean, somebody's raping and murdering and nailing babies to boards or whatever, and Canadian soldiers stop that, and while they're stopping it, they have to kill a few people. I think probably the Canadian public can live with that, providing it was for a just cause. And it would have been easy to explain that just cause.